learning the organ in the 21st century, what does that imply? Is learning the organ different now from, say, 50 years ago? We suggest that there have been five main changes in the last 50 years. First, we're all busier. For adults, the day job may spill into our so-called leisure time. More women work, so domestic work and childcare is now usually shared between partners. Young people often have a host of extracurricular activities. When they aren't playing sport, gaming, keeping fit, reading, singing or whatever, they are distracted by social media. This means that students of all ages may have limited concentration and one thing is certain, if they invest their precious time in something, they are impatient for results. Also, there are higher standards in the music profession, including the organ world, owing to recorded and broadcast music. The tireless efforts and the examinations of the AGO and the Royal College of Organists have played an important part in raising organist standards. And awareness of historical styles has transformed, enriching our understanding of, for example, touch and articulation, technique, registration. But despite these higher standards of playing, there are fewer organists and they are more thinly distributed. This means that students may have to learn without a teacher. It also means that new organ teachers may struggle to gain teaching experience. And an increasing number of people may learn the organ outside the context of church music for their own pleasure at home. So, we are busier, standards are higher, there is greater awareness of historical styles, but fewer organ teachers, and organ playing is no longer necessarily happening in a church context. We have both been thinking a great deal about these changes while working on two writing projects for student organists, graded keyboard musicianship and the new Oxford organ method. The first writing project was graded keyboard musicianship, published in 2017 in two volumes. These books provide organists with graded exercises in core keyboard skills. We believe that by training organists in keyboard skills from the outset, we could guide them to an advanced level without strain. Our aim was to promote a virtuous circle of confidence which could be reinforced at every stage. Have a look at a typical page. Here you can see linked exercises in figured bass, score reading, harmonising and transposing. These bite-sized exercises, unencumbered by text, allow a student to achieve success in all five skills in just a few minutes. The remainder of this lesson, on the next page, has an equally short exercise in improvising. Here is where we start, Level 1, Lesson 1. You can see how accessible it is. Figured bass. Complete these chords with your left hand using the figures indicated. Score reading. Play each chord using both hands. Harmonising A, play these chords with your left hand, naming the chord numbers aloud. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Harmonising B, play this melody with your right hand, then repeat it with left hand or organ pedals, playing a lower note as indicated by the Roman numeral. Harmonising C, play this melody with your right hand, then duplicate it in the left hand an octave lower. Transposing, play this melody one step lower 
in C major. Lesson one, as with every lesson throughout the two books, concludes with improvising. Improvising, continue the printed melody without changing your hand position, using C, E and G in any order and in any rhythm. Conclude with the middle C provided. You can also see that after the exercises we provide helpful text for the teacher to read aloud or paraphrase or for the self-taught student to use alone. As the text comes after the exercises it's optional to read it and it doesn't hold up the practical work at the keyboard. Our experience, yours too we imagine, confirms that delaying work on keyboard musicianship until diplomas or auditions is stressful for the student. Instead of finding them fun, the skills seem daunting. But students find these skills fun if they work at the appropriate level without undue pressure. In our graded keyboard musicianship books, there are eight levels and each of the eight levels contains five lessons. That makes, in total, 40 complete lessons, leading the student in graded steps up to diploma level. Now have a look at a page from the highest level. We mentioned that the accompanying text is optional, but if students perfect each exercise and digest the accompanying text through the entire course, they will find that they have absorbed a complete harmonic treatise. This means that a student reluctant to do written exercises could still acquire a comprehensive musical understanding entirely at the keyboard. Another way we try to engage the student is by using well-known tunes for the harmonising and transposing exercises. Look at level four, lesson three. Harmonising B asks the student to provide a bass part following chord symbols to Oh My Darling Clementine. C asks the student to provide a bass part in thirds or sixths below Che faro senza oridice. Transposing asks the student to play a tone higher the spiritual nobody knows the trouble I've seen. We use these tunes not only because it's enjoyable to harmonise a familiar melody, but also because it helps strengthen the all-important connection between listening and playing. We list these tunes in one of the appendices. We approach harmony from three different angles in each lesson. Figured bass, chordal progression, and designing a musical bass line. And we integrate each lesson so that, having learned a particular chord in harmonising, for example, the student improvises with it. Look at level two, lesson one, which introduces the dominant chord. Harmonising A explores for the first time the chords available in A minor, including chord 5. Harmonising B asks the student to find 5-1 in the bass under melody notes. Harmonising C asks the student to find the dominant and tonic notes indicated, making a perfect cadence at the end. Harmonising D has another familiar melody. The student adds a bass an octave below but moves to 5-1 
at the cadence. And then the improvising exercise invites the student to create a melody in a set rhythm using only the notes of chords 1 and 5 in C major. Let's think about how to include graded keyboard musicianship in a lesson. With this material, you could spend as little as two minutes each lesson and the student could still make progress. An even better scheme is to ask the student to do one exercise in each practice, performing to you at the lesson all they have prepared. You could also teach these skills in classes. We are currently teaching graded keyboard musicianship online to classes of five for the Royal College of Organists. Every student can play on mute throughout until it's their turn to unmute and play to the group. More advanced keyboard students who have gaps in their keyboard skills can use the books intensively. Again, being able to start at a manageable level builds confidence. We hope that graded keyboard musicianship meets the needs of today's busy student who may or may not have a teacher, who may or may not play in church, but who wants to enjoy discovering how music works at the keyboard. As soon as graded keyboard musicianship went to press, we began work on our next and much bigger project, which was published in 2020, the New Oxford Organ Method. The New Oxford Organ Method is a method book for the beginner organist or for the organist revising their skills. It shares with the graded keyboard musicianship books the aim of providing a graded course which integrates different elements and which is intended to be worked through from the beginning to the end. In many other ways, as we will explain, we hoped the content would meet the needs of the 21st century organist. We think it's the first book to teach registration, technique, style, interpretation and sight reading, and that it's the first method book to base the entire teaching, all those topics, in a seamless flow. Let's explain in more detail. There are 20 chapters, each centred around a single piece, and every chapter follows the same pattern. Each chapter starts with a short introduction, and then explains a fresh concept in registration. We usually slip in a technical exercise at this point too, asking students to listen to their chosen registration while they play, for example, a scale or broken chord. We then move into the style and technique section of the chapter. All the training in this section is inspired by the piece. There is then a bridge section linking the style and technique training with the piece itself called Towards the Performance. This section has two main functions. First, it guides the student in learning the piece. Secondly, towards the performance, aims to inspire the student with musical ideas. Then the piece itself, fully marked up with fingering and footing. Finally, there are three specially composed pieces which we called studies. Another technical exercise usually precedes each study and each study revises one of the topics introduced in the style and technique section. The first major hurdle was to identify 20 engaging pieces in graded order. The pieces had to develop technique systematically, introduce with each piece new points of registration and expression, and cover all major styles. But at what level should the methods start? What previous keyboard experience should the beginner have? We agreed that the beginner must have some keyboard experience and what we describe in the method equates to about ABRSM Piano Grade 3. But we also want the experienced organist to find the method useful for overhauling their technique and their understanding of style. So here are the pieces we chose. Part 1 10 pieces teaching ordinary touch. That's right, we start with ordinary touch because it's almost always a new experience for beginner organists. Part two, 
seven pieces teaching legato touch. And part three, the final pieces, teaching more advanced style and techniques. Before part one, there is practical advice called getting started and an introduction to the instrument. Now let's explore the chapters, highlighting a few ingredients from each. Part one devoted to ordinary touch with associated style and technique. Chapter one. The first piece is this two voice air by Purcell. The chapter teaches how to select a single eight foot stop ordinary touch, the five finger hand shape and position fingering. <laughs> One of the three studies that follows the piece revises the important skill of coordinating the hands, especially releasing together. Chapter 2 teaches the four tonal families, working towards Larghetto by Charles Wesley, and then explains how to manage stops of higher pitches. Helped by our list of stops at the back of the book, you see that we list stops under their tonal families. We introduce pedalling in Chapter 3, verset by Martini. Coordinating hands and feet is easy in the piece because it uses only one note in each foot. In the chapter we show how to operate the foot from the ankle joint. Then we introduce the student to note finding based on what we call the home position, middle C and E on the pedal board. After the piece, one of the studies reminds students about finding home position on the pedals. By the way, you see that above the study on this page we suggest how to prepare these studies when using them for sight reading. Stops, key, feet, hands and time. Charpentier. The student tries out the registration while playing a scale in the key of the piece. Unlike most methods, we include scales, scales in every key. We realise that, as well as their benefit for building technique and key awareness, our scales could have additional purposes to try out registration, to introduce the key of a piece or study, and perhaps even to reinforce a freshly learned technique. 
So we distributed the scales throughout the method wherever they're helpful. Our scales often have new twists, like added pedal parts. Chapter 5 is based on a choral variation by Pachelbel, and here the teaching develops touch, subtle variation of touch in the busy left hand, a singing line with the right hand's fifth finger, and coordinated releases. Next comes an old favourite, Prelude in F, attributed to Bach. Previously, the student has only needed to shift one note per foot. Now, they learn to measure intervals between their feet, using their heels as a hinge to measure tw seconds and thirds between the toes, what we call the heel V shape, using their knees as a hinge to measure fourths and fifths, the knee V shape. We always insist on knees together as we believe it's the quickest way simultaneously to establish confident note finding and a streamlined technique. Chapter 7 prepares students to play two concerto movements by Albinoni, which we arranged for solo organ. Towards the performance in that chapter, as always recommends specific practice strategies. We've underlined them for this presentation and you see that they are numbered. Practice strategy 8, use your pencil. Strategy 1, slow staves segments. Strategy 6, speak instructions. And strategy 11, metronome practice. These practice strategy numbers refer to a seven page section at the front of the method which lists and explains 20 practice strategies. Chapter 8's piece is a Preludium in F by Krebs. The teaching here includes pivoting the lower body so the knees hover halfway between the position of the feet and finding an octave between the feet. One of the studies which close this chapter revises pedal octaves. teaching we find the studies useful as revision of the previous lessons topics, like traditional studies. The student can also use these studies to practice performing, either at sight or after a slightly longer period of preparation. Most of all, however, we love that now we always have a ready stock of pieces to use for sight reading. Chapter 9 develops contrapuntal playing in a short fugetta by Bach. Topics include managing an inner voice as it travels between the hands and what to do when voices collide on the same note. Here is one of the studies which revises the collision of voices. Rising Passicalia by Frederick, which prioritises the pedals. The teaching here reminds the student again that ordinary touch is not a one-dimensional approach, but covers a range of expressive touch and even different periods. Part 2 introduces legato touch. Many teachers and most previous method books start with legato touch, but we have many reasons for starting with ordinary touch, reserving the complexities of legato touch on the organ until this stage. You're welcome to explore our reasons in the Q&A section after this talk. 
The first piece students learn in part two is the haunting elegy by Walton for manuals only. The chapter's topics introduce note commune and finger substitution. The first study to follow Walton's elegy features finger substitution and the scale that precedes it teaches students how to substitute fingers in double third scales for each hand. chapter introduces legato pedaling, including the use of toes and heels on adjacent notes. As always, these exercises are drawn from the piece, in this case, Quasi Allegro by Franck from Loganist. Now the scales are more ambitious. Here we have a G minor scale with hands a sixth apart and an independent line in the feet. Thirteen is based on Offertoire by Boehmann. The build-up to the piece includes exercises which illustrate how to operate the swell pedal with the right foot, while both feet play a legato line, and help the student make manual and stop changes. We estimate this piece is about ABRSM organ grade 6 standard. As you listen to Salome's Grand Coeur, the subject of chapter 14, you will hear how this piece was a good opportunity for us to introduce legato pedal scales. In the next chapter, we introduce pedal navigation points, sometimes called gaps. We introduce this note-finding technique late in the method, this is chapter 15, having learned from experience that many students who rely on this technique check every note individually, pointlessly jabbing in and out of those gaps. And we only encourage navigation points that maintain the inward tilt of the shoe. That is C and F in the left foot, B and E in the right. Then we show students how to apply the technique they have learned to the piece, Trio by Rheinberger. But first, in the chapter's topics, we provide the complete pedal part, annotated to show students how to apply the techniques they have learned, including those navigation points. And here is the opening of the piece, so you can hear the pedal part in context. substituting one foot for another on a sustained note and there is also a study which revises this new skill.
Rega specifies tiered dynamic levels, so the chapter begins by explaining how to choose these levels and how to scroll between them. The chapter also highlights new challenges in controlling legato touch. Now students develop resourcefulness in organ management using presets, pistons, if they have them. Just as we remind students in part one that ordinary touch is far from being a one-dimensional approach, in the next chapter, chapter 17, Solomon's Aria, we remind students that legato also adapts to fit differing circumstances, encouraging them to listen closely to the link between notes. This piece requires the right foot to move between swell pedal and the, and the pedal board without breaking legato. Here are some of the exercises that develop that skill, as always, complete with bar references from the piece. Part 3 completes the method with lessons in advanced interpretation. also teaches students to operate the swell pedal with the left foot and one of the studies focuses on that skill. is the first part of Book Tehuda's Preludium in C. Its style, the Studus Fantasticus, encourages students to develop their musical personality. The rhetorical gestures the student learns to manage are silence, descending scales and dotted figures. We've road tested every chapter many times in one-to-one -one lessons. And we find there are broadly three ways of using this method. First, some students need detailed support throughout the learning process. These students like to read the text aloud in the lesson, or the teacher can, maybe paraphrasing it. We worked hard to reduce the text to an absolute minimum. Students play every exercise, and the teacher checks the student's success at each stage towards the performance, guides the student in learning the piece, and here too, teacher and student may need to work together. Secondly, some students are confident and like working independently. These students enjoy working through the chapter alone and presenting the piece at their next lesson. This saves significant time in the lesson. One of my beginner students has worked through the whole book like this up to chapter 19 in just seven months. Thirdly, some students haven't got a teacher and may have to survive for long periods without one. We wanted this method to be thoroughly comprehensive so that such students can progress independently. There are more resources 
optional extras linked to the method available online. There are listening suggestions to accompany each chapter. There are also two extra pieces that we suggest you can insert between each chapter. Together with the 20 pieces in the method, this makes a suite of 60 pieces in graded order. We hope that all students, whether or not they have a teacher, will find this method flexible and approachable. Our aim is that the method helps every student to enjoy a lifetime of, to quote Peter Harford, making music on the organ.